And then I want to welcome you to this Better Brains for Babies sponsored webinar. Uh, we had a lot of, of interest in this webinar, and we're really glad that you all are here. Um, I want to quickly ex express gratitude to the uh, Division of Family and Children's Services Prevention and Community Support Section, who are our funders of Better Brains for Babies in general, and uh, including supporting this uh, webinar taking place. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Deborah. Deborah Chosewood, who uh, is going to introduce our speaker for today. Just reminders, if you will please make sure that you are muted and remain muted unless you are our presenter or unless we, uh, until we get to a point where you may want to ask questions. And I uh, hope you enjoy uh, all that we're going to learn today. Thanks, Deborah. You're welcome. Thank you, Diane. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I am very excited uh, to have the great honor of having Dr. Sege uh, come speak to us today. Uh, I have had the privilege of hearing him speak many times uh, at national and also state uh, uh, events previously. Uh, for those of you who maybe attended our Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, conference uh, a couple of years ago. He was our keynote speaker and uh, did a presentation for us there as well. And uh, I have also heard him speak. Um, uh, so I am the Deputy Director for Prevention and Community Support at uh, Georgia's Division of Family and Children's Services, as uh, Dr. Bales mentioned. And uh, we are Georgia's Children's Trust Fund. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Sege actually was honored to be the Ray Helfer Award winner, uh, award recipient for the uh, National Alliance of Children's Trust Funds. Um, and uh, so I've uh, gotten to hear him speak there and also previously in uh, many of those meetings. So uh, Dr. Sege is an attending uh, pediatrician at Tuft, uh, Tufts Children's Hospital in Boston and a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine, where he directs the Center for Community Engaged Medicine. Uh, Dr. Sege is a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Policy, which those of you who are familiar with Strengthening Families Georgia, Strengthening Families is uh, uh, output from uh, the Center for the Study of Social Policy in Washington, and he's also part of the leadership action team for Massachusetts Essentials for Childhood team and serves on the boards of Massachusetts Children's Trust and Prevent Child Abuse America. He received the 2019 Ray Helfer Award, as I mentioned, from the Alliance of Children's Trust and, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. He has served on national committees for the American Academy of Pediatrics and has been lead author on several important uh, AAP policies. His extensive speaking and publication list include contributions to the prevention and treatment of child maltreatment and youth violence. Uh, since this is Child Abuse Prevention Month, uh, I am wearing blue. He is wearing blue. We both have our pinwheels on. I have my pinwheels in my background, so hopefully uh, we don't have to pinch anybody. They've got their blue or their pinwheels on uh, as well. And uh, He's a graduate of Yale College, received his PhD in biology from MIT and his uh, doctorate from uh, Harvard Medical School. He lives in the Boston area with his wife, Karen, and they have re raised three um, young adult children. So I will turn it over to Dr. Sege. And uh, again, I am just so honored that you agreed to come speak with us today. And I'm excited about the great reception you seem to be uh, getting all ready here in, in Georgia. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I can unmute myself. First of all, thank you so much, Deborah, for the very kind introduction. It's really um, exciting to be here. Um, I wish I was actually in Georgia with you all, but we'll pretend to be in one big room. Um, today, we're going to talk about hope healthy outcomes from positive experiences. And this is a new framework that we're developed that is designed to work across sectors so that everyone caring for families and children will have the same kind of language to talk about. 
Our vision is a world that recognizes, honors, and fosters positive experiences because they're fundamental to life, lifelong health and well-being. I get to speak here. We have a great team. Um, Jeff Linkenback, who you may know from the Montana Institute, is one of our co-investigators. Um, Dr. Barack Floyd from Stanford is another co-investigator. And then our staff, we have Dr. Burstein, um, um, who's our project director, Amanda Wynn, who's our West Coast director, and two uh, terrifically talented research assistants, Chloe, and Ma Chloe Yang and Lauren McCullough. So let's start by saying, why does hope exist? And hope exists for a very simple reason, and that's because positive experiences can help children grow into resilient, healthy adults. Hope aims to evolve our understanding and support of these key experiences. And it sounds really simple, right? But for many of us in the organizations we work for, hope represents a paradigm shift in how we see and talk about positive childhood experiences that support children's growth. Hope started smallish. Um, in 2014, Jeff Linkenbach and I published an editorial in pediatrics called Essentials for Childhood, Promoting Healthy Outcomes from Positive Experiences. And as luck would have it, there's another editorial that I wrote in pediatrics that was released today called um, Reason for Hope. So, uh, so there we are. Um, but hope is spreading around the country. And Deborah mentioned she heard me speak. My colleagues and I have been honored by being invited to speak in a bunch of places. And we have several structures that we'll be talking about. We have the Hope National Resource Center, and that's me and our staff. The Hope Innovation Network, which are a few pioneering organizations around the country that are implementing hope, and then a large number of hope partner organizations. And through this, we're reaching many people and many children. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. So today we're gonna to talk about what is hope, the science of hope, the building blocks of hope, and hope in our work. So starting with hope, first word of hope is health. So what is health? Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is the standard definition of health, of health from the World Health Organization. And I think it's the same thing my mother meant when she bought me a new shirt, saw me put it on and said, wear it in good health. And so that's the definition of health that we use. I also want to mention, though, that what, what constitutes health is itself a cultural construct. And on the screen, you see the Navajo definition of health. And this adds to it harmony with a person's surrounding environment. So health is all of those things. It's not just the absence of bad stuff. So we're going to start with the first poll, and just to get a sense of the room, how much do you know about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs? And Diane, are you able to uh, post that poll for us? So if you, as you answer, um, you say nothing, a little, more than a little, but probably have a lot to learn, well-versed, or an expert. And we have about 200 people in the room, so I see the answers just piling up on my screen. So this is not Boston, so everyone only gets to vote once. So let's end the polling and look at the results. So there's a big distribution here, but most people um, feel they know something but have a lot to learn. A few are well-versed and a couple of people haven't heard of it. So let's go and dive right in with that. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences was a study that was originally done um, by Felidi and Anda and published in 1998. And they asked 17,000 members of a health maintenance organization about their childhood experiences and compared that to their then adult health. 
they asked about three kinds of adverse childhood experiences, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and five kinds of household dysfunction, a family member with mental illness or who was incarcerated or where there was violence in the home or substance use or divorce. And for each kind of experience an adult recalled, they got a point. And so that gave you ACEs scores from zero to 10. And in 20, um, 2019, Melissa Merrick, um, who was then at the CDC, and her colleagues published this report that showed the devastating consequences of ACEs. One in eight or 12.7% of U.S. adults with coronary heart disease, the most common chronic illness in U.S. adults, one in eight, their disease was attributable to adverse childhood experiences. One in four people with asthma, uh, four out of 10 or 44.1% of those with depression are our most common mental illness. A quarter, 23.9% of people with drinking, and even people who didn't finish their school, this could be attributed to adverse childhood experiences. So it really looks like bad stuff, doesn't it? And this has been critiqued. You know, 1998 was a while ago. And it turns out that there are additional community and social factor, factors that also contribute to what we now call toxic stress, which is that continued unmitigated, unmoderated stress um, that affects the health and well-being of children. And those effects are poverty, racism, historical trauma, war and migration, and neighborhood effects. And I'm sure that all of you who work with families understand um, that these things, in addition to the individual level things that were in the original study, um, can cause adversity and long-term effects for children. Wendy Ellis at George Washington University conceptualized it this way in her famous pair of ACEs diagram, that all of these adverse community environments, poverty, discrimination, disruption, lack of opportunity, poor housing, and violence are the roots and the, the flowers from that tree or the leaves from that tree are the standard ACEs. So it's important to look at it um, more broadly, which is certainly a 21st century way of looking at these same issues. However, and what I want you to do, though, is now we've talked about ACEs, right? And we've expanded the definition of ACEs to also include community effects. What I'd like you to do, just take a moment and think of somebody. It could be someone you know personally. It could be a public figure. It could be the person you see in the mirror in the morning. Um, but someone who had childhood adversity, um, but is doing well as an adult, maybe even someone you admire. Because as we go through the next section, I want you to hold that person in your mind and in your heart so that you'll understand how this works, not just at a statistical level, but at a deeply personal level. So as we go through this, we talked about how racism and other factors can affect health in a negative way. And now we're going to flip to talking about positive experiences that also affect outcomes. And we do that because we know and I hope that many of you were able to bring a person to mind with a lot of adversity, even four or more ACEs are okay. And from that, we believe that other experiences affect the brain and these positive experiences may affect our mental and physical health outcomes as well. So before we go there, um, Diane, if you can launch the second poll, um, and this one is now looking not at adverse childhood experiences, but positive childhood experiences or PCEs. How much do you know about PCEs? Nothing, a little, um, more than a little, or well-versed. And it looks like our answers are actually they're still coming in, but they're slowing down. Do you want to, should we stop the poll and see the results? Okay. So a lot of people have heard a fair amount. This is terrific. Um, but if you look at it, it's still a little bit less familiar than ACEs. But I actually am delighted to see um, that 
Uh, people have heard the term before, and many people know more than a little. So this is great progress over the past few years as we've been talking about this. Uh, myself and, of course, many others have been uh, talking about this issue. We talk about it because positive experiences are so important. They promote long-term health and well-being. They allow children to form relationships and make connections. They provide a sense of belonging and mattering. And they help us all build scope, build skills to cope with stress. And I'm assuming that everyone is listening today, except for one little kid I saw, um, are adults. And you know that as you grow up, there are opportunities where stuff happens and there is stress. And one of the things is developing that ability to withstand that stress and be resilient. And that's what positive childhood experiences are so good at building up. So we asked about positive childhood experiences in a population study uh, that was part of uh, Je Jeff Lincolnback and Jennifer Jones' Wisconsin Positive Community Norms Project. We added questions to the, um, a statewide survey called BRFIS that already asked about ACEs. We added seven items about positive childhood experiences, and then we're able to correlate that with adult mental health. So here are the items, and these were adapted from uh, the work of Dr. Unger in Nova Scotia, who developed them for the World Health Organization. And we choose the WHO scale because it had been used around the world, and we thought that people from a variety of cultures um, could use it and be validated. So people were asked, think back to your childhood, and how often as a child had you felt able to talk to your family about feelings, felt your family stood by you during difficult times, enjoyed participating in community traditions, felt a sense of belonging in high school, felt supported by friends, had more than one non-parent adult who took a genuine interest in you, and felt safe and protected by an adult in their home. And what um, our colleague, uh, Christina Bethel, and, her, and the group at Kimmy um, did for us was took these questions and made them into a scale, the PCE scale. And those with a score of six or seven, who had six or seven of those seven kinds of positive childhood experiences, had a 72% lower odds of depression or poor mental health as adults. Those with a middle number, three to five, still had a 52% lower odds of depression or poor mental health. And anyone who's done survey work knows that these results are astounding. Now, now earlier on, we had talked about the devastating effects of ACEs. So what about people who had four or more ACEs? And so among these people who had four or more of the 10 possible adverse childhood experiences, if they had zero, one, or two positive childhood experiences, very high rates of depression and poor mental health, 60%, but it plummeted to 20% if they also had six or seven positive childhood experiences. So when you reflect now or later about the person that you brought to mind who had a difficult childhood, maybe even a high ACE score, but came out as okay as an adult, I'd like you to think about what positive childhood experiences they might have had um, that mitigated or weakened the effects of that adversity. So I'm going to stop and see if there are any, if there are any questions that come up in the chat. I haven't been able to speak and monitor the chat. So Diana, do any questions rise up that we should um, address? I haven't seen any yet. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have any questions for Dr. Seki as we go along, feel free to put them in the chat because we are going to pause a couple of times to answer. Okay. <clears throat> the only questions I can't answer <clears throat> are, um, have to do with Zoom. Um, so PCEs in the brain. So we're going to talk about brain changes from positive experiences, healing, following trauma and adversity, and adversity. And because this is the building better brains, I'm a little scared <clears throat> of how you all are going to interpret this because there's so much stuff on the website. But we're going to go and give you little snippets of how we think this phenomenon occurs in the brain. So first of all, we know that the brain changes with positive experiences. And for obvious reasons, from an experimental point of view, these studies are mostly done in adults because uh, you can take adults and put them in scanners and things like that, and you don't have to get their parents to consent, and it's okay. 
Um, so this was a randomized trial of meditation versus a more general relaxation approach that was published by Dr. Kwok in 2019. And they showed, first of all, that people who'd been through a two-week intensive meditation course um, did better at mindfulness, which is sort of what you'd expect, and did better on a standard measure of resilience. But here's the kicker. When they put them in the scanner and a functional MRI machine, they were able to see changes in brain function, something called resting state functional connectivity, which is how well different parts of the brain connect to each other when we're at rest. Um, so structural and functional changes in the brain went along with learning a skill like meditation. And um, it's also, I think this is the most dramatic one, that our brains change when we learn to read. People have done pre and post, before and after evaluations of what happens when you teach an adult to read. So if you take an illiterate adult, do a brain scan, and then a year later, after they've learned to read, do another brain scan. And what you see is the acquisition of literacy is associated with reinforcement of the left temporal parietal connections. Um, and what that means is that these connections between the part of our brain that sees and the part that understands language get highway, big connections between them as we learn to read. Um, so that's how the visual what we see in reading becomes words. Pretty amazing um, that you can actually see those changes in scans. And this has been known for a while. This was a 2014 study that built on um, other studies, including one done in 2010. Now, so it's one thing to say the brain changes with positive experiences, but what happens to people who suffer trauma? And in this set of pictures, we have what happens after a stroke. So in this, which is the normal person, when I wave my right hand, part of my left brain lights up, it goes to work if I was looking in a scanner. So that will go. The side on the right here, on the same side as my hand, is kind of quiet, not a lot of activity. And then when a person has a stroke, at first, they might not be able to move, like for example, their right arm. But with therapy, and interesting, both activity-based therapy, therapy in cognitive-based therapies that involve envisioning movement, the brain rewires. And these areas on the same side as that hand that used to be quiet now fire and move that hand so our brains rewire. And it's really simple how that happens, right? Each of us has something like 2 billion neurons. Um, a little hard to count, but that seems to be about the right number. Each neuron has up to 10,000 connections. And of course, each of those connections has maybe another 10,000 connections. So if you're the multiplication, you go 2 billion times 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000, you get to a really high number. So we have an enormous ability to rewire, and that's how recovery happens. Now, most of us are actually concerned not with stroke or physical damage, but with psychological um, trauma, emotional trauma. And this study was done in Japan after a big earthquake. And they found that post-traumatic growth is characterized by subjective, that's the person's own opinion, positive psychological changes um, from major life crises and traumatic events. And what they found was that the brains changed. In certain parts of the brain, there was increased gray matter during recovery and higher scores on the post-traumatic growth index were associated with stronger activation of the executive functioning network region of the brain. So our brains change after trauma to allow us to bounce back. Resilience has a physical brain component that builds on that rewiring from our billions of neurons and thousands of connections to each one. So how does it work? How does the brain change wiring? Well, think for a moment about a superhighway, right? So what a superhighway does is the cars or trucks go down it, they go in a straight line, they, they don't go through all the local roads, they keep it a nice, constant high speed. It's all pretty cool. And we use them to connect places that have a lot of interaction, right? Well, our brains work the same way. And you can see here two neurons. 
The one on the left is uninsulated and it's sending a little signal down from the nerve cell on the top to the axon at the bottom at the synapse. And you can see that it goes slowly and kind of dies out a lot of the time. However, when the brain notices that there's a lot of connection, it makes these insulation things. Those cells are called oligodendrocytes, and that stuff is called myelin, and it's what makes white matter in the brain white. And you can see that that signal just shoots down there at a high speed, doesn't get lost, doesn't go anywhere else. And this is what happens when you make connections between two regions of the brain. And that's what we saw on the MRIs when someone learned to read. Another way this works is through um, overall hormonal effects on the brain. So when we learned about ACEs, we all talked about cortisol, which is that fight or flight um, hormone. So you know when you're scared and your eyes dilate and your heart speeds up and you start sweating, all those things happen. That's because of a stress hormone. There's another hormone, and I hope many people have experienced this at some day, uh, when you fall in love, or I know everyone experienced it on the day they were born, or gave birth, or other happy things, you have a burst of oxytocin. Oxytocin is pretty cool um, because people can release it in synchrony. So oxytocin was first described because it supports childbirth and breastfeeding. Um, and then people noticed that it increases in all parents at time of the birth of the child, regardless of the gender and regardless of whether they were the birth parent or the, or the parent's partner. And I love the way scientists say this because um, synchronous release promotes affiliative interactions. So that means when you fall in love, you both feel great. Um, but it doesn't sound more scientific if you call it a, affiliative reactions. Love it. So, so that's what happens in the brain. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go on to exactly what we mean by those positive experiences. But um, Diana, I can see there are more comments in the chat. Are there questions for me? Most of it has been just been comments about what great information this is. Nice. Um, uh, Deborah shared the positiveexperience.org website. Some people asked, where can we get more information? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to see if there are other um, others that are relevant right now. Um, just an observation, sometimes people know how to read, but they don't know how to function in society without learning through experience and being shown how to do the important things was a mm -hmm. comment that was made. Um, Deborah commented when you were talking about neurons and myelination that you're speaking my language, which is absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> um, I don't think, fascinating and great information, very useful in order to take Care, good care of foster children. So nothing that you really need to respond to right now. Just lots of okay, thank yous great. for the information. Making me smile. Okay. So um, Charlene Harper-Brown, who um, is, works for CSSB, but she's from Atlanta and works in Atlanta, um, which is like right near where we are now, I guess. Um, she and I wrote a paper that we published in 2017, where we looked at what experiences do children and, and youth have in interventions that worked. And we identified four kinds of experiences that we're now calling the building blocks of hope. The first one is relationships with other children and adults through interpersonal activities. The second are safe, equitable, and stable environments for living, learning, and playing at home and in school. The next was social and civic engagement, so they develop a sense of belonging and connectedness and emotional growth. And this happens, as you can see in this little um, diagram here, through playing and interacting with peers for self-awareness and self-regulation. So focusing on relationships, for each and every one of us, relationships begin at the moment we're born. And there we are. And there's our mom. Um, and there's a relationship that's perhaps started a little bit earlier. The first foundational relationship is, of course, with our mom and very quickly with other caregivers, if there's a dad or the mom's partner or grandparents or other <clears throat> constant supportive figures in the child's world, those relationships, which are called um, foundational relationships, begin right away. And they form kind of the template for other relationships, including peer relationships and eventually relationships as teens and adults. Everyone needs a safe, equitable, and safe environment for living, playing, and learning at home and in school. Much of the research that backs this up is based on work that's been done at schools 
on something called a positive school environment so that children can feel loved and that they belong at school. <clears throat> Apparently, famously, schools are supposed to be um, like a family, not like a factory. And if you hold that in mind, you understand that's what a safe, stable environment is. Social and civic engagement. This picture is a group of teenagers who designed the logo for Hope, obviously taken before COVID. Um, and the social and civic engagement help us develop a sense of belonging and connectedness. So this can begin with chores at home, or if the teacher has the students do different classroom tasks, or as you become a teenager, if you volunteer in the community, if you play on a sports team and you're responsible or you know, your whole team depends on you, or you sing in a choir, all of those activities make you feel like you matter. Very important part of growing up. Then I mentioned earlier emotional growth, and this happens through playing and interaction with peers. And this is how we develop self-awareness and self-regulation. And this is important because it's not always beautiful at every moment. And disagreements among kids and things like that are how we learn uh, about social um, and emotional growth. But I want to take us back to ACEs for just a second and think about them, right? So we said there are several categories of adverse childhood experiences. And child abuse and neglect disrupt the foundational relationships. The reason they have such long-term consequences is because we are supposed to experience love and um, unqualified love from our parents. And if our parents beat us, for example, not so much. And we can also feel that our homes are not a safe environment to live and play. Family disruption can disrupt the safe environment. Think about intimate partner violence or even the economic consequences if the parents um, aren't raising the children together. In adverse community environments, reduce opportunities for engagement and for emotional growth, both of which require active involvement of kids with their uh, friends and neighbors. Um, so now we're gonna take about five minutes for breakout groups. And what we like to do in those groups is have you discuss um, how you increase access to one or more of the building blocks. And there are two questions. What do you already do? And um, what would you, what more can you do? Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your breakout rooms. And just as a reminder, the two questions we asked are, uh, what are you already doing to increase access to the building blocks? And what more can you do? So why don't we use the chat box? <clears throat> and if you could um, send in just a few comments about what you're doing or what you're planning on doing, increasing access to the building blocks. So we have an opportunity to learn just a little bit from each other um, as this goes on. And again, I'm gonna call on Diane to read comments in the chat box as they come through. Sure. So go ahead. We don't so, have any yet, but I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. I'm waiting. All right. So, um, please don't chat that there's a typo on this. Connecting youth and families to community, fostering natural supports. We talked about how important it is to provide positive experiences, especially for foster youth, like through encouraging team sports, other connecting activities. I'm working on my DNP doctorate in this area. Nice. The other, other feedback on what y'all discussed. As the Connections Matter trainer, I'm helping parents and adults understand ACEs and how relationships can mitigate the negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. We discussed that even if we mainly, oh, now they're coming in fast and furious. Even if we mainly work with adults, sorry, they're coming in fast and furious. It's hard to keep up. Um, even if we mainly work with adults, it's so important to help those adults create positive experiences for their children. Helping foster children cope with their experience by telling them my experience while growing up in a broken home. In our group, we talked about some direct supports being provided, like concrete supports and helping people see that other things are possible. For things coming, we talked about services like Family First, providing uh, more support to safely keep children and youth at home. We're already working with families and children, positive parenting programs, youth groups, being trauma-informed, building resilience. We would like to do more about collaboration with other organizations to work with school-aged children, reaching out to others on how to get resources. We discussed mainly how much the environment influences the healthiness of kids. 
My partner did work with big brothers, big sisters, provide parent-child interaction activities, parenting around development education. One of our resolutions this year was to do a family service project each month. The kids have really enjoyed the feeling like uh, as children, they can make a difference. I engage and assist people we work with in building relationships. We talked about leading by example for emotional growth and talking through reactions to facilitate emotional growth. We've got like 20 more. Do you want me to keep going? No, this is great. <laughs> and I know I'm going to save the chat. And encourage yes, absolutely. I will as well. So as well. There are a lot of good things. <clears throat> but the reason to go through this exercise is because we're convinced that hope is not totally new at all. And that it, there are things that we already do and sometimes we feel like roads because we're supposed to be screening for you know, drugs, or domestic violence. And instead, we're talking with families about making those connections or going to the playground. You're not being a rogue. You're doing what the family needs. They're both part of the family's need. And one more quick exercise. I'd like you to look at this cartoon and um, write in the chat box. And Diane and I will both read them. We'll go back, we'll go back and forth. And just write in the chat box now any risk factors you see in this cartoon. Oops. We'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Electric cable near the baby, cleaning supplies on the floor, parents not interacting, smoking, unhealthy food, bugs. No interacting, unhealthy food, clutter, debris, holes in the walls, it's a mess. Okay. Now, look at the same picture. And now I want you to reset your mind and look at the picture and see what protective factors you see. Uh, first one, they are together. There's a crib for the baby. There's indication of faith. There's an adult in the room. They're in the same room. There's food, togetherness. There's a pet. There's a book. There's beds. They have electricity. Safe sleep, safe sleep environment. Furniture, toys, entertainment, clothes to wear. The girl's wearing glasses, so she must be getting health care. Good, good pickup. Clothing, shelter, books. Okay, they try to clean up, and that's probably why the cleaning supplies are there. Good. So now we're going to do our last Zoom poll. This is great. Uh, to the last Zoom poll, what I want you to do, and Diane's going to post the poll up, and just tell us what's easier, risk or protective factors. Okay, keep those votes coming in. Polls are still open. Have your voice heard. Big moment, we're still waiting for 37, 36 people. Okay. What do you think, Diane? Are we there? Okay. So most people, two out of three of us, found it easier to see risks. Um, quarter of people, a little more than a quarter, 28%, thought both were about the same. Only 7% thought the protective factors were easier to see. Um, that's a really important observation. And what we think that happens is that we have from training and experience, two kinds of thinking. Type one thinking, which is really fast. It's intuitive, it's unconscious. It happens through everyday activities. And I think one of the most interesting things to think about is remember in the old days when you used to commute to work and you kind of can't really remember. It's almost unconscious because you've done it so many times. So it's not necessarily simple activities, but it could be complicated things. It's effortless and it comes from training and experience. 
Type two thinking is slow, calculating, conscious thought. It, we, it's what we do when we see something novel or we're solving a problem, and it definitely takes more effort. So when you do a lot of type two thinking, you're going to go home and say, oh my God, my brain hurts. That was a hard day. We need both kinds of thinking. Um, but so what we're talking about is that viewing risks for many of us, either by our disposition or by our training, has become type one thinking. And through practice and training and experience, we can move positive, see positive things, which is now type two for many of us into type one. And, and just as an aside, you know, all of us, when we meet a new person, we try to assess whether they're friendly or not. Um, and implicit bias really comes from that type one thinking. It's fast, as we would call intuitive, it's unconscious. It's something that we've learned from living in this society. And what we need to do is to become conscious of that bias um, and then use our type two thinking to stop it and to create new habits. And if we do it enough, the way our brains work, um, it will become second nature and become type, type one thinking. It's hard to do. So this is all about how we see ourselves, how we see our students or our clients or our patients, what's a risk, what's a strength. And um, Jennifer Jones, the National Alliance for Strong Families and Communities, developed the Change in Mind Initiative, and they called this cognitive reframing, which means changing our habits of thought. Not easy, but it can be done through repetition. Now, unfortunately, there's only so much time in the day, in an hour. I want to just tell you that on our website, we have um, um, two videos. One showing um, a doctor in this case, um, interviewing someone about postpartum depression. And in this one, it's doing it in a fairly rote, straightforward way. Um, and then, Dan, why don't we just take three minutes and see what it looks like when you do a, a standard screening for depression, but using the building blocks of hope. And so if, uh, if you can, I'll stop sharing. If you can put that video up and then uh, we'll do a little um, show and tell. I want to bring it home what this actually looks like. And this is about a three minute video. Just want to mention Dr. Floyd's a real doctor, and the person who's the depressed mom is her sister playing that role. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Floyd, one of the pediatricians. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Um, I know it's been a little over a, a three or four days since I last saw you guys. Um, and how's baby doing? Uh, she's doing okay. She's kind of love when she makes her little faces and, and just it brings me joy sometimes to see that. I bet it does. It sounds like it going, getting to know her is going well. Yes. Okay. Um, did you have any questions or concerns today? Mm, not really. Uh, not really feeling myself lately, but besides that, good. I thought that's just normal new mom feeling. You know, it is really common for moms to have at least a little bit of baby blues after having a new baby. Um, so, um, the purpose of our visit today is actually to talk about your postpartum depression screen. Um, but first, it sounds like you already know you're struggling a little bit. Yeah. And how's dad adjusting? Um, he's, he's doing okay. Every day he does a little more and is a little more involved, but he doesn't have a lot of experience around babies. So, well, I'm glad he's getting some now. Um, do you guys have other support locally? Um, we've had some people that have been in the house, um, the last couple days, um, a sister and then an aunt and a cousin. Um, sometimes it's been good to have them, sometimes it's not been because you just kind of want peace and quiet and you can't get that with all these people in the house. Yeah, I bet. Um, but it does sound like they're able to help and support you around the baby when they're around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I encourage you to set boundaries when you need that quiet time, but let them help you. Yeah. Um, so I want to go over your results from your postpartum depression screen just to make sure that this agrees with how you're feeling so that we can follow the score 
over time um, while you're working with your home visitor. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so looking at the screener, you answered nearly every question saying that you were struggling nearly every day with little pleasure or interest in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless, not sleeping well, feeling tired or having little energy. Are you still feeling that way? Yeah. Um, so, Mama, this does look like you're, you're struggling with postpartum depression, but what I'm really happy to hear is that you're open to having a home visitor. Um, I love that you have support at home because um, that extra support is really, really helpful. Um, is there anything else that we can do to support you between now and the next time we see you in clinic? No. Okay, perfect. So I'll see you guys in a week. Um, just to check up on your little girl's weight, and you should hear from the home visitor um, in about a week. If you don't, please give us a call at the clinic. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day. I want to thank you, Dan, for showing that to us. And I just want to tell you a few notes that I took when Dr. Floyd was talking with the, with the patient. She asked about the relationship. She talked about mom and baby and mom and dad really early on. Um, so she got a sense of this young mother and her answering relationship. She asked about the environment and what she said was, what other supports do you have? Very open-ended question. And then the mother um, said, talked about her family and they were visiting. And then Dr. Floyd responded to some of what she said. Um, by giving her advice about how to set boundaries to make that environment feel like she was in control and that she didn't have to be sort of passive and resentful and make it a safe environment, which is, of course, why everybody was there to, were to support her. Um, and finally, I love when she said, do you have any concerns? And the patient said, I'm not feeling myself. And then they explored it. And then Dr. Floyd used that to go into the depression screen results. This is a hope-informed maternal depression screening. And this mother, like many people, it's not a secret to her that she's feeling a little down, right? She knows that without the screen. And Dr. Floyd was able to elicit that concern and then use the screen to help discuss that and eventually to connect her to home visiting as a resource. So really amazing stuff to do. And if we had shown you the before and after, the, the one without hope, you would see that this was about one and a half minutes longer, not much longer. But think how much more effective it is because she has a relationship with the young mother and the young mother is thinking this is her problem that she expressed to Dr. Floyd, I'm not feeling like myself, that led to this result. Instead of you did your screen, you came out with this, we're sending you to the Center for Defective People and they're going to fix you all up. Um, which is kind of how people hear it if you don't add hope um, and positive experiences and strengths. And so what I love about this too is it looks very conversational, but Dr. Floyd is using the building blocks of hope to guide her conversation. So I just want to leave you. Uh, I have no time left. I'm going to leave you with an image anyway, so if you can stay, hold on a second. I think that the way I think about this is people are like trees. We carry our past with us. Um, some of us are fortunate enough to live in multi-generational forests uh, where we thrive and share resources. Um, sometimes there's trauma, and that trauma can be acute or life-threatening, but many of us carry old trauma. And if you look closely, you can see it, and you can see the scars where it healed, but we're still healthy. Some of us live on our own, and if you look closely, what you might think is this tree, maybe it was transplanted, maybe it grew up somewhere else, and now it's thriving in a new environment. Um, some of us grow older and create, even with our complicated history that leads to this fantastic branching pattern, something of beauty that people will stop and admire um, through all that life experience. So I want you to leave you with a moment to reflect on how each of us is like a tree and that we have all these experiences, sometimes good, sometimes traumatic, we grow through them um, until we become adult. And that, what creates, that creates our individuality. So when we think about ourselves and our clients or patients, think about us in that way, 
as we're the product of all of our experiences, the ones that cause us to flourish and grow tall, and the ones that are traumatic and we need to heal from. So I want to leave you and thank you for all the work that you do. Um, please come to our website, positiveexperience.org. If you're interested, um, later this month, we'll be launching a learning management system so you can learn more about it. We have plenty of resources. Send an email to hope at tufsmedicalcenter.org. We'll be sure to get back to you. Um, and Diane, thank you so much for inviting me. I really uh, appreciate the chance to talk with you and to help you out with uh, all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And thank you for that, that wrap up imagery that just helps so much as well. Uh, I'm seeing lots and lots and lots of thank yous in the chat uh, as well. So people are very appreciative of, um, of your, your, everything that you had to say today. Great. 